Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Vin and Ali show. We're actually in person right now, so it's a little bit, it's strange, isn't it? Should we touch? Oh, should we touch? Yeah. We touched. Oh, oh, we touched. Oh, my hands are a bit weird. wet. Yeah, it's, Is that it's weird? Gross. Yeah, Sorry. it's gross. Yeah, but you ruined the start of yeah, uh, our <laughs> second episode for 2023. <laughs> the book we're reviewing in person this time mm. is The E-Myth. This one has been a game changer, I think, for both of us. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned a few things before we kind of kick things off that re- Rereading this and going back through the notes was a weird experience for you. Yeah. One of, the, one of the big things that stood out is just as I was reflecting back on my notes, the first part was that this was probably one of the first, like call it business professional development books that I read going back to 2014. Mm. And after I reread it, I went to Chantel and I'm like, oh my God, Chantel, I think I was actually smarter eight years ago than I'm now because my, the quality of the notes were just so much more detailed <laughs> and deeper than they were this time around. Yeah. And I'm like, I actually don't think that my thinking's evolved in any <laughs> single way. And I might have actually regressed a little bit because I was like, oh my God, yeah, that, those ideas from back then were actually better than the ones that I noted down now. So uh, it was a bit of a sad realization for me just to see whether, um, yeah. I want to unpack that a bit more, <laughs> but before we just unpack that, this is basically, I think, a book for I mean, it's the book that I recommend the most when someone's starting out yeah. a business because it talks about the three different roles that are critical for you to be able to run a business. Mm. And the three roles are the entrepreneur, the manager, and the technician. Yep. And the book, the, the, the core premise of the book is most people are technicians in their role. And then they go, oh, I'm a really good technician. I should start a business. But then they're, <laughs> they're unaware of the entrepreneurial role and yep. the manager role. And then when they start a business, they fail. So one of the core reasons I, I recommend this book is because there are two other roles that we tend not to be aware of. For right? sure. But let's dig in now. Why, why do you think, like, is it actually that you're more stupid? I hope not. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, think, I don't know if it is that, right? I think it's uh, definitely that this was one of the first three books that started off my entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. And it really did shape the start of that. Mm -hmm. So I think that when I was reading these, just because it was so live and everything was so new, it just had such a massive impact. Yeah, so I think yeah, when I look yeah. Back yeah. on that, it was probably that. So it's more like you said again before we started. You were saying how it felt like you found more nuggets. Yeah, and you were you were acting out. Well, you were applying the wisdom at a higher rate, mm -hmm. whereas now the rate at which we can find wisdom and nuggets, it's you know you don't find as many now. Diminishing returns. Yeah, diminishing returns. Which, uh, which three points do you want to cover in this book, Ali? Three and, points. Yeah, I mean, right. we, 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 want to, we want to get better at this podcasting thing. So we want to <laughs> give the audience a sense of what we're going to cover. It's already five minutes in that yeah. we're doing this. Yeah, so yeah. What, what points do you want to hit? We should always do our introductions like five to ten minutes in. I feel. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> now, now the real intro begins. I think uh, one of the big ones is I just wanted to really dig into how this book really influenced my startup journey um, Ooh, and cool. sharing that story. Okay. You go? I, Next one. Yeah, do three. Oh, you want me do to go all three? three? Yeah, do all, right, all cool. three. I really liked um, the idea of working on your business versus working inside of it. Mm -hmm. And that as a mindset shift and also how that's evolved over the past yeah, few years. That'll be interesting. And then really digging deep into what you mentioned at the start, like the roles and the personality types of the technician, the manager and the entrepreneur. Well, the only one that, because those two of the ones you mentioned I wanted to talk about. So the only one that I didn't have on the list, the one that I want to talk about is the business should serve you, not the other way around. That's cool. super foreign to me. Yep. Yeah. So that's what I kind of want to dig into a little bit. And if I had to pick one other one, I want to dive into well, why I think it's important to actually be the technician first, because I've mm. met some who are just entrepreneur and then move into this model. And then there's bad too. Ooh. Yeah. because And I was that for, for a period of time. So too. I like this because I'm probably the opposite. Yeah, end you're of the, the entrepreneur, right? Yeah. I'm the technician. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I think so talking, about, really cool. I think talking about the dynamics between yeah. the entrepreneur and the technician, right? Because as a technician, I think you're an idiot, <laughs> right? <laughs> as an entrepreneur, you think I get like, I'm an idiot, right? Because you think I get stuck into the weeds. And I'm focusing too much on who cares about what color yeah. the backdrop is, dude. Right. So yeah. I think that'll be an interesting kind of discussion to go Love through. It. Very cool. Let's, uh, let's do the one, number one on your list. All right. Cool. So let's maybe start just with how this book, I think, and this probably applies to mm. both of us, how yeah. this book really influenced and shaped our entrepreneurial journeys. And I think we've both got stories really early on mm. in our lives and careers um, around how they shaped it. So pretty much in 2014, 
this is one of three books that I read that were essentially my version of the start of my own MBA rather than doing one at a real university. I thought, can we hack this with $75 worth of books? Mm. And the three books were The 4-Hour Workweek, The Lean Startup, mm. and E-Myth. Yeah, wow. right? And when I look back on my notes from this, it was really incredible because I think the biggest thing that this book gave me was structure. Mm. And I love it. Like, it, like as you go into the book, mm. like it spends pretty much a full chapter talking about McDonald's mm. and how amazing McDonald's is as a business, right? And I agree with that. I'm a big fan of McDonald's <laughs> and have been from a very young age. A <laughs> big supporter of them. Yeah, big supporter of McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's always amazing, right? Like it really doesn't matter where you are in the world. Yeah. Whatever whatever you want. Generally speaking, yeah, yeah, the level yeah. of consistency that mm. McDonald's has delivered over. A, decades yeah is just mind blowing right pretty amazing yeah. and and it talks about like businesses as a, as a turnkey and really planning with the end in mind and then mm. breaking um yeah sort of breaking in from there and i think that was really important for me in the startup journey reading this book because rather than just hacking it together mm. and just having the technician's mindset or the manager's mindset that we'll dig into a little bit later yeah is that it really did start me off from a point of all right, well what does this actually need to look like at mm. different journeys and and it's really cool like looking back at some of the notes so you still have your notes i still have the 2014. notes 2014 right and like i've got things like it because future golf before it was future golf was called gen y golf wow. right so i've got notes here so it's like That's so special gen y golf change the game of golf you know become a powerhouse within the industry and then I've got like little bits here because it talks about having to identify the market. I'm like, back then there was 167,000 golfers in Victoria aged 18 to 40. Um, let's try to get 1% of the market, right? So this is like wow. the big dream in Victoria. It was like 1,670 members. So when I read this book, we had about eight members, wow. right? So it was like trying to really maximize as far as that thinking could go back then. Mm. And then I even break down. It's like, all right, 200 members is going to be the first milestone at $189 each. And then it's got sort of what that totals into. And then like the dream outcome was to get to 2000 members. Um, and then it was like, try to get $7 profit per player at each event, you know, and, and get a little bit of sponsorship revenue, right? And so it really helped wow. shape some of the business plan here. And it's awesome now thinking back on that, where we're well past some of those metrics. Yeah, you're, you're, but, you're $8 now in the bank account. Yeah, that's right. yeah. no, we're, now we're actually losing money per, per person. <laughs> but, but yeah, we've definitely uh, 10x the number of members. So that's great. But wow. I think it's, it's awesome just now looking back and being like, even early on, yeah. how having this sort of approach help shape that well the what well, i mean what you're saying there is the importance of structure when you're starting because yeah. you've got a bit of a fence to play in that's right. whereas if there's no fence that's 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 where most people go wrong right i mean that just wow yep so that's that it. that means i'm i'm getting a lesson there that anytime you start something new find a structure to play within that's because it. that structure gives guidance on how to start right for sure and i even mm. now like even we've been doing some strategy stuff with the business recently mm. and my focus is still sort of going back to the principles here where it's around, all right, well, what's the vision? What are the key strategic objectives? Yeah. Who are the people that we need to, you know, get into the business and the talent that we need to right, achieve right. those? And yep. I think this system is just consistent. You know, like mm. if you do focus on the planning and the strategy, it makes such a big difference. And I think in the book they mention it, they're like, what generally happens with the technician? And they use the example of the, it's of Sarah, who's a baker, yeah. is that, you get an, I think they call it an entrepreneurial seizure, mm. right? Where all of a sudden it's like, I, I bake good cookies. I should be doing this myself. Yeah. And, then the, and then it's like, let's go start a business quickly. And it's not really well planned out. And I think that's what strategy and structure and, mm. you know, trying to have a bit of a resource budget really helps with because it allows that entrepreneurial seizure to actually well, I think it's. out a little bit I think more. it's important for those who are not familiar with yeah. the entrepreneurial world, Ali. Yeah. Let's define the three roles yeah the entrepreneur sure. the technician and then the manager because what you're describing well, there, the structure that's kind of the manager isn't it for sure mm. yeah a little bit of both and i think that's like do you want to jump into the yeah. definition of the three well look i mean you're the entrepreneur yeah. so why don't you describe the entrepreneur cool so i think the entrepreneur is probably like the visionary mm. right the the big picture thinker the the person who's dreaming about what the business can become mm. in its like grandest form mm. right it's like the things that haven't yet happened yeah but that we believe in that we want to put in all our efforts into to make turn into a reality well, it's the person that lives in the future correct you you spend most of your time in the future and if we used if we use time as a reference then yeah. the technician is the person that lives in the present so the technician listens to the entrepreneur and goes okay i get you want to do this high in the sky thing but that doesn't exist yet. We have to create the thing in the now, the vehicle in the now that's going to get us to that point in the future. 
So then, then there's usually that argument between the entrepreneur and the technician a lot, right? Which That's is right. funny because our friendship is based around a lot like yeah. that. Because every time you, you talk to me, you're like, hey, man. I see this grand vision for you. I'm like, no, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I'm never going to be able to achieve that. Four years on, I'm doing the very thing you said I was going to do. I'm like, wow, okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> so that's when I start to respect more. you more. Yeah. It was after year five in yeah, our friendship. That's right. Because when we first, first met- First four years didn't really make sense. It did make sense no. because I remember when you first came to a workshop, my stage workshop, the first one I ever ran. Yeah. You came and you're like, hey, bro, this is- uh, You've created something incredible here. I'm like, this is the shittest thing I've ever done in my life. And I was just like, this guy's a fraud. He's trying to he's trying to sell me something. Yeah, just flattery. Yeah, just yeah. flattery. He's trying to win me over and yeah. then trying to take advantage yeah. of you somehow. Yeah. And you told you Which saw I was. this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you saw this incredible vision for me. I couldn't see it myself because I was the technician. Yeah. I was the one building the workshop. And you said, you know, one day you're gonna be doing this for Fortune 500 companies and you'll be doing all of this stuff. And and I just didn't believe you at all. You know, and, and now I'm running a workshop for all these companies around the world <laughs> and people come from all over the world to Adelaide for my workshop. Yeah, you exactly. saw it, man. You hey, saw hey. it. You saw it in the original theater that I did the workshop Stage in. Stage one. That's Stage right. Stage one. Same theater I do it yeah. in now. And this last workshop, I had someone from Austin, had someone from Texas, had someone from Seattle, London come along, right? So, so, so that's the funny thing. Technician is in the present, mm. focuses on the present. Execution. Entrepreneur, yeah, execution driven. Yeah. Uh, entrepreneur is vision driven. Mm -hmm. And then the manager, which I don't think we both, I've had to learn how to get good at it, but not me innately. It's our weak spot. It's our weak spot. Yeah, yeah. We're missing a manager. And how would you describe a manager? Yeah. I think managers are about order, right? Mm, so to me- The strategy. Yeah, and they kind of bridge the gap between both. Ah, yeah. yeah so both. When, when the entrepreneur has all the ideas and all the pie in the sky stuff. Yeah, yeah. The managers and like, all right, how do we put all of this into order so it works? It's almost right? the, the manager's the translator as well, right? Because the 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 manager translate what the entrepreneur wants to do yep. and makes it actionable so the technician can do it. Yep. And in the book, they also talk about the manager kind of maintaining the status quo. Right. right. So one of my big notes from this when I was reviewing it, just given where we are in sort of the entrepreneurial life cycle, mm. is that I've got gaps at the moment probably more in that space, both the manager. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Both mm. myself, but then also within the ecosystem where we've got, you know, a little bit of the big thinking, we've yeah. got a fair bit of the big picture thinking, we've got a fair bit of the execution stuff. It's mm. so like, how do we now bridge that gap um, to get it a little bit more orderly in that sense? Yeah. I think the, the manager one's a tough one Yeah, because without them, nothing actually happens. Well, because the technician can be doing all this work, but it's not in alignment with the strategy that, yeah, yeah. I, th I still think of the manager as the translator. Yeah. And in yeah. most small businesses, yeah. I think that role gets played as a mixture of between the technicians and the entrepreneurs. Well, well the crazy thing is when you're starting out a business, initially, yeah. you are all three. Play every role. You play every role. And I think one of the main reasons, and we kind of touched this on, on this on the start, is that the main reason why a lot of businesses fail is because they only, they're only playing one role. Correct. And generally it's the technician or generally it's the entrepreneur. So this is what kind of brings me to the point I wanted to talk to you about. When I first got into entrepreneurship, I was the technician. Mm. And I, I remember going into this kind of co-working space and then being introduced to a group of other entrepreneurs. And they were entrepreneur heavy. They were visionary heavy, right? And it's funny because I saw, I could see why they were failing. Because I'm like, well, you're not doing anything. You're just meeting with a bunch of people talking. You're not okay. doing anything. That's why you're failing. But, no I, ideas. but I yeah. couldn't see why I was, why I was failing yeah. because all I was doing was doing with no real vision, with no real direction. I was just doing. So it's, it's just kind of interesting how there's no one that you can be good at and you'll be successful. Yeah. You have to have this distribution of all three. It's like split personalities nearly. Right, yeah. where we, if you're going to do it solo, you need to kind How of. What is that? Yeah. And one of the best bits of advice that I had early yeah. on in my career was scheduling out times to play all mm. of the different roles. Mm -hmm. So, one of the exercises I remember doing, even after reading this book in 2014, mm. was even though it was just me and like a couple of mates, I drew mm. out a full organizational structure like what we would look like when we were a massive organization. Now, wow. there was all these position descriptions. That were like, all right, you know, there's the CEO, there's the CEO, there's the head of marketing, there's the all these other bits and pieces. But it was just like one person, pretty much, in all of the in the blocks, right? But that was like that's right. today's organizational structure. 
but hopefully in six months time in two years time this will actually be filled in with individuals in each of these spots has it Um, has it worked out exactly that way yeah it it has at times Mm. like even now we probably still have more of a hybrid type of structure yeah um sometimes you can over structure i think in businesses too especially when they're relatively small yeah it's you know where you've got two defined Mm. um and then it needs to i think it goes in in peaks and troughs right where it's like you go with structure then you pull it back then you change it up a little bit but generally speaking i think it's a pretty sound approach mm. especially when it's linked to like say jobs that needs to get done roles that need to be played yep. accountabilities that exist within the business it's a pretty important part um and then reviewing that at each point of the journey as well so yeah i think it's it was really interesting doing that exercise but then what that really helped with even early on it was like okay on monday Mm. Put the entrepreneur cap on, mm. right? On Tuesday and Wednesday, play the role of the manager. Mm. You know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, whatever it is, it's like now be the technician and actually get the jobs done. And then you kind of can batch them because it's really hard to switch. Like if you're in full on technician mode and you're doing and you're doing and you're doing, yeah, it's really hard to then be like, oh, I'm just going to now get big picture with the entrepreneurial yeah, hat because the energy isn't really there. Mm. So it's trying to find the conditions for each of those personality types to exist. Did you find there was a better time in the week to be an entrepreneur, a better time in the week to be a technician, et cetera? For sure. Like, I think I still love being an entrepreneur on Sundays at the cafe. I oh, go and have wow. a coffee, go for a walk, listen mm. to a book, you know, sort of detach myself a little bit from right. the day-to-day a bit. Mm. And that was my thinking time, you know, strategizing, journaling. Mm. And then, yeah, I think Monday's a pretty good day for management. Yeah. Because you can sort of check in, plan out the week, all the things that need to get done. Um, and then you've got the rest of the week, I think, to be a technician. If that's, that's sort of a baseline structure, I think, especially early on in the journey, mm. technician part takes up a fair bit. Yeah, that's where most people time. drown. Yeah. Well, because I, I think back to when I was doing professional magic, being a professional magician, the reason I failed was just because again, I was a hundred percent a technician yeah. and I didn't realize I had to, you know, manage my time. I didn't have to think about when when I'm going to spend time to build a website, when I'm going to spend time to do marketing, when I'm going to look for new clients, when I'm going to reach out to old clients, look for referrals. I didn't do any of that. I thought being a professional magician was just, you just get really good at sleight of hand. It's that baker thing. Just be a good baker and you can run your own business. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it's, it's, that was a very big unlock. And I don't want us to just kind of walk past that because if you're, you know, one of our listeners right now are thinking of going out there, being an entrepreneur, you could be a designer, you could be a pharmacist, you could be a magician, you could be a baker. You just have to understand that there, there is education for all three roles. And generally the path that we get taught traditionally, we're only just super good at our technical role, but you actually have to read to become a good entrepreneur. You have to learn how to become a good manager. And I think a lot of it is just learning how to switch between those hats and also recognizing which one of those hats or which one of those roles do you really suck at? For me, it was definitely the entrepreneurial side and the manager side. Mm. So did you get better at all at being a technician or did you just hire for it? Yeah, I think definitely hired for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for being honest and truthful because, yeah, I was going to say, if you lied there, I would have called you out. That was a trap. It's so well done. <laughs> you avoided it. I saw that one coming. Yeah, I was like, um, come inside. I mate. think I've always naturally yeah. been quite an average technician. Yeah. Right? Yeah, like, I'll, true. My, my, <laughs> as far as I'll go is, like, I'll quickly validate an idea. Yeah, and yeah. I, I see you do that. For that. Um, well, but I mean, I, 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 won't, I won't, you know, discount you for that too yeah. because I've seen you validate stuff for me. Yeah as a technician really fast. You know, like yeah. I wouldn't say it's a nine out of 10 no. execution. But it was like, yeah, it was, you know, it's like a seven out of 10 execution. Yeah. Like I remember when you did Facebook ad stuff for me yeah. three, four years ago, yeah. you validated an idea super fast and we got to break even as well. Yeah. I was like, wow, this is pretty impressive. That's what I do. It's like, just try to find out whether the overall concept is yeah. sound. And then from there, try to amplify it a little bit more with people that actually have that skill set. Mm. Right. So I think, um, yeah, I've got pretty, uh, and that's just been my life throughout all of my career is I work the best when I find amazing technicians. Yeah. Right. And also great managers like because I play, I'd say most people probably skew like maybe 10, 20% to the entrepreneur, yeah. especially when they're starting out mm-hmm. on ventures. And then they're probably like a combination of manager and technician and technician um whereas i think i've always skewed pretty heavy to entrepreneurs so i would have been one of those guys at those entrepreneurial yeah, events yeah, yeah, yeah. and unless you know we ended up in a nice group where there was a good combination there of yeah. managers and technicians yeah um yeah my ideas are probably just staying in the in the idea basket rather than being executed or you at see, least not being executed at a very high level the important thing there 
is knowing which one you are innately. Yeah. Which one the are natural. you- Natural. Natural, yeah. yeah. Because if you're confused and you think you're like, again, you, you could have beat yourself up. And I've, I've seen you do this as well at times. You go, ah, oh, maybe I should spend more time getting better at my execution game. Mm. Remember that? This was like three, four years ago. Yeah. Where you had those moments where you're like, ah, oh, I see Vin working so hard. Maybe I should become yeah, mastery. Better. Yeah, yeah, yeah mastering one skill set. That's right. And I remember you doubting yourself there, and, and to me not being a good friend. I was like, yeah, man, you, you should be better. You're not a very good. At ex- you're not very good at execution. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just do the same process yeah, over yeah, and over again. Just, you'll just get do good. the same thing over and over yeah. again. And you're like, ah, oh, but every time I do it, makes me want to vomit. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but then I then I feel shitty too because then I thought maybe I need to dream bigger. Maybe I should be be a bit more of a visionary. And we'll just. And I remember that so vividly yeah. because we'd be getting on calls. I'd be in the US, you're in Melbourne, and we'd be talking to each other. I'm in the late at night, you're in the morning or the other way around. And we'd kind of be grilling each other a little bit about how we should be more like each other. <laughs> and that's really interesting because I think it's just important to, to lean in towards what you're really good at. Yeah. And, and when you can, you mm. try to hire for the other roles. For sure. Right? It, it's, yeah, it's, it's such an interesting kind of transition period because at the beginning, you can't hire for it, man. You've got no money. You kind of have to do all of it yourself. And you just got to get good enough and get far enough to make a little bit of money and soon as you can hire for it. For sure. And I think yeah. that's it. What you hit on there is spot on. It's yeah. get the awareness of which one you are naturally within yeah. business or work, or whatever it is, and then team up with others that have that defined skill set in the other areas. And that's how you really get compound interest, I think, yeah. as, a, as a unit. And it's magic, right? When you when you put yeah. together the three, like I've seen it at multiple times in different mm. realms where you, you get that, co- especially when you get the combination of the entrepreneur, the manager and like technicians, yeah. mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. where all the magic happens. Like even if you trace back, I think most really successful business stories, yeah. they generally have that combination. Like even I think back to the Gen Y golf days when we were early on, mm. even within like two or three of us, we had that. Mm. Like uh, probably a year or so in, we had myself, we had Rowan, who was, I'd say the manager role. And yeah. then we had Marcus, who was a technician yeah. who understood golf, would run the events. Mm. And like, even in a really small unit team, we had that trio yeah. uh, combination and it worked. Right. Mm. And then it maxes out at a certain point. Like I think the book talks about, you've got the business cycles where there's infancy, there's adolescence, and then it's how do you then evolve? Right. Because at some point your manager, they only have certain capacity that they can manage with the, the technicians that they've got. And then mm. it's that iteration of expansion, right? Like how do you get more people with entrepreneurial thinking? How do you get more people that can then manage that thinking? And then it flows down. And, and that process is still the same even now, eight, nine years ago. Wow. It, it hasn't really changed. We're yeah. still just reiterating the same process, just trying to get more people, yeah. different skill sets that align with the moment that we're in. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking now back to what are some of my early journeys. Mm. I, I remember when I started uh, you know, an online business teaching magic tricks with two of my friends and we were all technicians. Mm. And it's just making me reflect on, wow, that balance is so critical because when that balance is off and you're full all technicians, it's frustrating because you're all good at what you do. You're all putting your heart and soul into it, but you get no result. Yeah, yeah that's so interesting. It is. And it, I think it's really hard to value entrepreneurial, like the entrepreneur's work and the manager's work. Because really? sometimes, sometimes it's so? not as tangible right. and you don't get that return straight away. Right, right. So it's very easy to just default to, oh, we need more doers. We need right. more execution because that you can track, you can see it. It's like, mm. all right, you know, Vin's doing eight hours of magic. Yeah, He's getting yeah. this, this amount of return. That's and then somebody will suggest, oh, should we, should we bring in a manager to come in and amplify? It's like, yeah, but we're doing the work anyway. Yeah. Why we need we, another Ali? Yeah, nah, why, nah, why, nah, we, nah, why, we bring in, why would we bring in a manager? And then it's like even the next level, it's mm-hmm. like, oh, let's bring in like a CEO, an entrepreneur to really, oh, it's like, why would we want to do that? We're just yeah. going to have to work even five times as hard doing the, doing the shows or whatever it is. But I think what you then miss out on mm. is the expansion of that thinking yeah. that builds out the whole ecosystem. It's so true, Ali. I mean, I've only come to respect that, I think, in the last two to three years because I've seen some of the moves that you saw for me play out. Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah. I, 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 yeah, you, to, you, you can now see, reflect back on yeah, that. Yeah, I can reflect yeah. back well, on that. Well, that's because I'm reminding you. I've yeah. got notes. I'm like, hey, but here's a screenshot for something I sent you in 2016 or 2017. And you're like, oh, but that happened. It's like, yeah, I've like, just well, been conditioning you slowly over a period of yeah. time to show you that hey, if you plan for this stuff in the future and you actually think it out, you've actually got the execution skills to be able to pull off. But I don't have the vision skills to be able to see it. Yeah. Right. I think- I, think, I don't think you do. No, I, I think I don't. 
I think I don't. <laughs> thank, thank you for thinking for me, right. but yeah, I can think for myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I don't. Okay, you don't. Yeah, 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 don't. Sorry, yeah. sorry for, yeah. for trying to make you feel yeah, good. Yeah, don't, don't yeah, no, for apologies. Me, yeah. <laughs> don't tell me what gonna I can't do. You're going to keep your self-esteem yeah, up so you gonna... can keep uh, achieving magical outcomes. But it's, it's, it's a good point that you bring up because I think you're right. We always value the doers. And yep. we sometimes in society don't value the dreamers. Well, but, but the reason we don't value the dreamers is because there are a lot of dreamers that as a result of no, not getting enough doers around them, yep. dreamers become delusional. Yeah, They're just sure. people who are delusional. <laughs> and, and it's funny, do, people who are delusional are only de delusional because they don't have the doers around them that can help bring those dreams to fruition. That means... Delusional people is not bad. It's just you haven't found the right team that was able to help you make that a reality. I mean, the, the classic one is Elon Musk, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. He he wants to make us a multi-planetary species. He's finding the right doers. It's going to happen. Yeah. And it really goes just to show that. Well, until he yeah. bought Twitter, I think everyone believed that. <laughs> you know, like, if you think about it, if you yeah. did a survey two years you ago, know, it's like, will Elon take us to Mars? Super high. And yeah. then Twitter happened. It's like, oh, is he still going to take us to Mars? I don't know now. Is it just a weird, is it just turning into a weird sci-fi movie now? I'm not you sure. Know, you know, the saddest thing is that I know, I know people judge him so harshly, <laughs> but at the end of the day, he's just the person. Yeah, it's true. And I think, you know, it's funny because I had this conversation with one of my good friends, sidetrack here, but it's, he, he was really upset with his parents, just really upset with his parents. And he was upset with his parents because of the expectation he had that his parents are perfect people, yeah. that his parents always know exactly what to do mm. and always have the exact right answers. And that's, that's just not true. <laughs> because I, I, I still remember one of the things that improved my relationship with my parents mm. to the max was me realizing that they have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> when they become human. Yeah. yeah. When I realized that, these two people that I felt like always had the answer, these mm. two people that I felt like always knew exactly what to do, I saw them in a vulnerable moment where they had no idea <laughs> what the hell they were doing. And that reality just broke for me. Yeah. And I went, wow, you... <laughs> and then that actually, funny enough, made me feel so close to them. And I extend that kind of love and compassion for a lot of people in the world who are thrown into the limelight uh, whether it's entrepreneurs or whether it's role models or, you know, whoever, I'm just like, they're just people though. Yeah. And we have such high expectations and yeah. yeah Elon's got pretty high expectations. He so. does. And I, I, yeah. I can't imagine what that weight must feel like. I just, oh man, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I just, I just feel really sorry for him. Yep. I'm just like, Whoa. yeah, <laughs> poor Elon. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I don't know. I do feel sorry for him. Why, why are you saying it in a way like you don't feel sorry for him? Like, I do. Can you imagine? No, that was a beautiful, the, that yeah, was a beautiful just, speech on compassion and care. Yeah. No, but I think it's, I think, yeah. I think it must Elon, be hard. No, I'm really interested to see whether he gets to Mars. I think, I think if he collects the right doers, yeah. you've just given me a full reframe on delusional thinking. Delusional thinking is just dreamers who haven't found the doers. Yeah around them to be able to bring that dream to fruition. And sure. I also love the call out, and I know I'm bringing it back time and time again, but it's just the, the call out to the dreamers that you are so important. Mm. Because without dreamers, we do the same thing every day. Nothing changes. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that there's definitely, <clears throat> there's a variety in the quality of dreamers, right? And there's a practical application to dreaming too, mm -hmm. which is ultimately around, I think, communication. Mm -hmm. and clarity around what that road looks like. Okay. Like if you see the big difference between like old mate down the street that has a random idea about something that goes nowhere, I think the real critical difference there mm. is they just haven't really thought it out too deeply. Like you can be a dreamer and an entrepreneur, mm. but you can still have detail in the story that you're trying to paint with the picture, right? right, right? right. Because it's still quality of dreams. It's still the quality of the dreams mm. and how deep are you willing to go to paint that vision? Right, because then once you have it pretty clear and it aligns, yeah. Then the next part about it is finding people with alignment. And I think this is where like a lot of luck or call it the universe and chance has yeah. to take place as well. Mm. But what I've found is that most of the times there's one, two, three, four people already in your current ecosystem yep. that are already potentially going to be aligned to that dream. And if you can find those people and 
sell a good enough story, mm. then it's that journey probably starts. And I think where most of these dreams fall apart mm -hmm. is that you'll have somebody, maybe yours, that will come up to you and be like, hey, Vin, I've got this great idea and this big plan. I'm sure you get it all the time, mm. right? You ask a couple of questions. And once you go past those couple of questions, there just is enough depth to it. Or, or they just can't get you excited enough about what that story is. And that dream dies then because now no one's believing in it. No one's going to invest time. Because if you think about mm. how a dream turns into reality, it's people believing in it enough that mm. they're willing to put energy, time, and resources into making that dream turn into reality. Well, they've got to be excited about they've it. They've got to be excited about it. They've got yeah. to be inspired by it. They've got to have somewhere in the back of their mind where they can also see <clears> it playing out. You know, it might not be a 90% chance it's going to succeed, but enough mm. evidence there yeah. that, okay, if we do these three, four things, and I think it goes back to having, even if you are a dreamer or more of an entrepreneur, mm. you need to have basic enough skills to validate your concept yeah. so that you can make other people around you believe it, right? Like if I just told you, hey, it's going to be awesome, just start an online, like start an online course or mm. run a workshop and just see how you go in these countries. And it's just like, that's, it just stopped at the idea yeah, without yeah, actually yeah. showing you how that's going to play <laughs> out with some validation of a landing page or some ads or yeah. doing some research with some of your existing audience. Yeah. You then won't believe it. That'll just die off as an idea and be like, hey, that crazy guy keeps telling me to do stuff again without really any evidence that this is going to work. <laughs> so I think you do need to then prove it somewhat and i think that's what good entrepreneurs do pretty well whether it's in their pitch decks yeah it's when they go to those events and they tell their story it's got the ones that have great stories generally get funding and they get people wanting to join them on the journey as well what you're talking about there is a minimal viable product it is and and that applies to your vision and your ideas and your dreams okay. so it's interesting even at an entrepreneurial level if you are innately an entrepreneur you still need six out of ten execution ability yeah. You got to have at least that. Somewhat. Yeah. You got to, right? Because if you don't, then while you're starting out, how can you even get an MVP together? Unless you have really good communication skills and you can attract doers really early on. Yeah. You see, that's interesting now then. Because that means if you are at heart an entrepreneur, you have to be really good at communicating. Because even if your idea is kind of half baked, right? Half cooked, you can still get enough people around you to actually make it a reality. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I've never thought about it like that. You've got I, a few I, different ways to win. I yeah, think. you do. Either, yeah. You, either you have to be good at execution Enough. so you can get an MVP together mm -hmm. and then get people on board or no execution, be really good at talking, <laughs> right? But have clarity on the idea and can win technicians over and managers over to actually help you build that dream. For sure. Interesting. Yeah. And if you think about people that have had success previously, yeah. they generally find it pretty easy on the second and third time to go and get people to believe in their dreams and their stories, right? Like it's a bit like Elon. Elon yeah. just built enough of a resume yeah. where it got to the point where it's like, since we're going to go to Mars, we probably have to start believing it because he did it with the cars. He did yeah. it with PayPal. He did yeah. it with this. He's done it four or five times. Digging like, tunnels underground. Yeah, digging tunnels yeah, underground. It. <laughs> it's like there's enough evidence here that he's probably got the skill set yeah, yeah, that yeah. even though this idea is so like improbable, yeah. we'll probably back him in on it. And I think that's it. You, like after a while, even as an entrepreneur, you can build enough evidence, right? And that, I think you're right. It comes from either executing it yourself yeah. or finding people to help you on that journey. Well, well, just, I know we're using Elon quite yeah. like yeah, <laughs> a lot here, yeah. but it's, he went down the path of, he's actually a great technician too. You know, the, the stories of him sleeping under the office table, right? So you can go down that path or you look at Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs wasn't overly technical. He used this communication ability. Absolutely. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because even if you are an entrepreneur, that communication ability is so important mm -hmm. because he was able to get all of the best minds from all over the place to come help make his vision come true. So you, both, you can go both ways, whichever way you want to go, you know, sure. depending on, see what, what, what this is really about, brother, that you know, it makes me think is that level of self-awareness that you have on your journey is so critical. Because if you're not self-aware enough to understand that, okay, sure, maybe communication is a really weak point of mine and I don't want to spend time investing in improving that, then you better get really good technically. Or if you think, I'm not really good technically, but I'm kind of good with communication, then go down that path. Mm -hmm. It's just about understanding what toolkit you've been born with and then learning the rules of the game and then going, how do I navigate this game now knowing what tools I have? I love that. I think it's such a great point. And Generally speaking, like if you're at a point where you're thinking about starting a business, mm. you've probably got enough technical ability or experience there that gives you some advantage, yeah. right? Like even though I'll say that I'm not a great technician, there yeah. was a few things though that I was actually probably 
even though they're not traditionally technical skills mm -hmm. that I was pretty good at, right? Negotiation, win-win yeah. deals, mm -hmm. strategy, bit of marketing. Yep. Like, so in those areas, I, I had enough of an apprenticeship in my back pocket where I'm like, okay, if we set a goal, we have a bit of a plan and we try to create value in this way, mm -hmm. we've probably got a pathway to winning mm -hmm. somewhat. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also having enough self-awareness to identify where you do have these advantages or strengths and you've put in the work and have some experience that validates that, okay, this is an area that I can use. It's an asset. And then having enough awareness to know, okay, where are we really weak and truly weak here where I need to get help with that. And my biggest weakness at that point in the journey, it's doing the same thing over and over again. Right. Like, so as soon as there was anything to do with that, like I could have maybe run one or two events, <laughs> but running 50, that's going to be tough Dude, here. That's like, so exciting I, running yeah. 50. It's yeah. so weird, man. Yeah. That's like, it's so weird. I feel like I'm, I'm speaking to a different species of human. Yeah. It's like, I it's love like, repeating oh. things over and over again. It's like, it's like the scariest thing that I can think of. That's <laughs> it. I need that variety and the change that. So go back to your story, right? Mm. How did this book influence you in the magic world? Well, but before we dive into yeah. that, sorry, just let me okay. close out this point is that I, I, you've just given me this insight that I, I hope helps some of our listeners who are entrepreneurs. And it's that when, when you have that level of self-awareness, it allows you to identify in your boat where the leaks are. I think at times the reason why businesses sink is because they can't identify where the leak is coming from. They know that the business is slowly dying, but they don't understand exactly where the leak yeah. is coming from. And often the leak is either coming from, you don't have a strong enough vision, you don't have a tactical person who can identify which moves you should be making, which entrepreneurs are great yeah. for, you're great for. You know, It's either coming from that, moving in the wrong direction, or it's not being managed well, or we just got the wrong technicians in the wrong places, right? Yeah. So that, that level of self-awareness is so, so powerful. Huge. And the more and more we talk, I just realize it's all about self-awareness. Awareness for your business, awareness for yourself, awareness for the team members that you have. It's just, yeah. yeah. And, and a way to build that out, if people are wondering, how do I improve my self-awareness? Mm. It's seeing, writing down like what you think's true. And then asking four or five people that you respect, like, <laughs> do you see this the same way? And then I think it's also reading Whoa, books. Whoa, that's pretty vulnerable though. Right? It is so, vulnerable. Am I a good friend? If you want to fast track it, yeah. like that's probably the best way. Wow. Um, and then I think the other one's reading, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're reading a book and the book's like, it's a really well-regarded book. Yeah. And then it's telling you these things in these certain categories. And then you're reading, you're like, oh, I don't do any of these things. Mm -hmm. It's like it probably shows that there's potentially a gap there in what needs to be done versus yeah what's being done at the moment i really like that i love that advice of writing things down and then going asking a few close people to you but i think yeah. not just people who are close to yeah. you but people who are really good in that arena that yeah. you're asking for feedback for. that's right for example yeah. if you're a technician you can go to someone who's a really good technician and go hey am i actually really good at this or yeah. And then you truly realize, you yeah. know, where you sit. Right? That's right. Like mm. asking your mom about yeah, whether mom, you're a good, a good account. archer. Yeah. Hell yeah, you're a good <laughs> yeah. archer. I could never yeah. do what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Ask him, you know, yeah. silver medalist. Yeah. Nah, mate, but, you're terrible. But then you could go to your mom and be like, hey, am I reliable? Yeah. A yeah. Am I yeah. inspiring? Yeah, yeah. Am I, do I have some character traits yeah. that, are, that I need for these things? So there's probably different people that you can ask <laughs> certain things um, along this journey. <laughs> Mum, am I a good person? Are you a doctor? Yeah, no. No. <laughs> no, you're very bad boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah so, so choose the person yeah, wisely yeah. is what you're saying. Choose them very yeah, wisely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, don't ask my mum if you, you know, you're successful <laughs> yeah. and you know, you're not a doctor. That's hilarious. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. So my journey, yeah. you're asking, right? My journey with this book, I kind of touched on it before, and it's that as a magician, I didn't realize the value of thinking big. I didn't realize the value of managing my time and the strategies that I'm doing. So I failed miserably in the first two years as a professional magician because I was only wearing one hat, the technician hat. And then that's when I had to learn and read Lean Startup, which is another book. We yeah. probably should do that on a yeah. podcast. It's a great book. We'll that one. But that one taught me the importance of, well, there are so many other aspects to running a business as a magician, as opposed to just being the magician. You know, I, I realized that, and the big trap I fell into was when I got gigs, I would do the gigs. And while I was doing the gigs, I wouldn't be trying to get more gigs. So I had this crazy cycle in my business of nothing to really busy <laughs> to nothing to really busy to nothing. I'm like, this is the worst <laughs> thing in the world because then it led me to living to paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. And I got paid well as a magician, but there'll be just these massive gaps. There was no consistency. It's because I was 
I was either prospecting or I was doing the business. Yeah. And it was just, and that leads me to the topic I want to talk about. And that's, I would always be working in the business and I never spent time working on it. Mm. So then that, that again, like you said before, where you have to create days where you're, you're an entrepreneur, days where you're a manager, days where you're a technician. When I learned to not just work in my business and work on my business, my magic career uh, as a professional magician flourished. It was unreal how that simple move changed my business. And you mm. hear this line of, don't just work in your business, work on <laughs> yeah, your so business. That sounds so cliche <clears throat> and it's patronizing. So <laughs> I know, it really does. Anytime anyone says it now, I'm just like, oh, it's so cringy, but so powerful. <laughs> uh, something that Seth Godin says, just because something becomes cliche doesn't mean yeah. it's not potent, mm. that it's not one of the most important things. And this is one of them. So as tried as it sounds, as cliche as it sounds, holy shit, it's one of the most powerful business lessons ever. And for me, the way I did it was I always just spent Mondays. I would always purely just prospect. I'd purely be a marketer. And on Monday, I'm just marketing for business. And then on, on, on the Tuesday, I'm kind of managing the business because my, my business fell in the fact that I, I'm only doing gigs on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and generally Thursday, Friday, and Saturdays. Yeah. That's it. So those are my technician days. Yeah. So all the other days, I broke it all up. Whereas before, it was just anytime the gigs come, <laughs> yay, got it. I didn't systematize referrals. I didn't systematize yeah. any of that. Whereas the systems started to be built out. So. Yeah, and that's well, that was me working on the business. Mm. Working on the business. Part of it was when am I a marketer? When am I doing admin? When am I emailing past clients asking for testimonials? And then that in that process there was me systematizing it too. Mm. But I was still doing it all myself. Yeah. So I, I never got out of that really. I think I'm still <laughs> in that. Yeah. As well. I haven't really got out of that. I, I could see you transitioning out of it though at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. watching Bambi on Ice yeah, skates on ice. right now. But, but a really elite Bambi, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, this yeah, is like, an elite Bambi. Yeah. Like, it's, it's this doesn't have like, a skate yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, but nah, like the best, oh, best Bambi yeah. you've ever seen. Um, well, like wearing camo and, you know, just, <laughs> yeah, just really cool Bambi, though. Like, let's yeah. set the scene. I love how me. you've turned Bambi yeah. into like a military figure. Mm -hmm, That's, mm -hmm. I've never heard. I love military. <laughs> I mean, if people listen to this podcast, we always, I always look at the things I'm doing as missions. Yeah. Missions, platoons. Mm hmm. So, yeah. so when you now reflect on it, because I think it's cool that we've got somewhere between eight to 10 years yeah. in this game. Mm -hmm. how, how do you feel like you've changed in terms of those three roles? And, what, and one of the things that the book talks <clears throat> about too, two-part question, mm. is it talks about the conflicts between all three that exist yeah. internally. Yeah. Um, like how does that play out for you as well? I, I am still not very good at entrepreneur. I've gotten a lot better as manager. Uh, and I know we haven't been giving a lot of love to that role, but <laughs> a lot of love out there. We don't understand big, it. Big, big shout out to <laughs> the managers out there. We love you. Uh, we need no, you. No, but, no, yeah, but I've, send I've us an email. I've, yeah. become, I've become good at it. I've become good at it as a manager. And yeah. I think where I am now, Ali, is that I, I'm the manager who's gotten really good and wishes they could spend more time as the technician and needs to bring in the entrepreneur. Yeah. And that's why our collaboration is really cool. You know, you're helping me a little bit now with, with what I'm doing, right? And that's really cool because I need that kind of entrepreneurial figure, you know, in my life. Yeah. And I want to look for a manager to bring into my business or multiple potentially so that I could stay where I'm the best. I'm the best as a technician. So it's funny. I had to learn how to become a manager, gotten really good at it. That's helped me succeed a lot. But then now I kind of hate the role and kind of hate myself a little bit because I'm so good at it, at that role, where I'm like, I really miss being a technician. Mm. You know, like th just two days ago, I messaged you. I was in the studio filming stuff and I was having the time of my life. Eight <laughs> hours just melted away, man. <laughs> Laughing, creating, designing, and just, oh, it felt so <laughs> good. Yeah. And then at the end of that, went back in, sat on the computer. I was a manager. Yeah. Hated it. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird to it's weird to dislike something you've become really good at. Mm. It's weird. It's weird when you also you know you have to do it because it's important. Yeah. Even though it doesn't fully align. And mm. and I think there's always in every role that those conflicts exist. But one of the thoughts that I just had there as well mm. with you being a technician. 
Yeah. And it just uh, the line that came into my head is like, I think when you become such an elite technician, like what you are, I think you then transition into becoming an artist mm. and it's like you elevate beyond it where you probably can create so much value from your technical work that it allows you to be potentially, you, you don't have to invest as much time into the other two, right? Mm -hmm. Like I've actually seen you do it where yeah. you can just focus in on one technical delivery. Like say, for example, your keynote career, mm. where it's just going hard as you can as a technician. Yeah. And you just get so good beyond any doubt where you're one of the best in the world, mm. where realistically, even with minimal management and probably entrepreneurial thinking, yeah, you don't need it. Like at early on in your career, you probably did yeah. to get established, mm -hmm. but it's now at the point where you could have a post-it note on a Wix website being like, I'm going to do keynotes with the YouTube link to your, your reel. Uh, mm. You're probably getting booked. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> An Instagram <laughs> post. A, you're like, probably yeah, yeah. not. Just, just bring you back like, to reality for a second, Dreamer. You're like, uh, probably yeah, not. Yeah. But no. <laughs> so maybe the better example would be like Ed Sheeran, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Not me, but yeah, yeah, Ed Sheeran. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So like, Ed Sheeran probably just has yeah. to whisper if to he, someone. If he just went down to the local, local deli, park. local deli, yeah. stuck up a piece of paper, That's right. people would find out about that so fast, post it on social media, packed out by tomorrow. Done. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. But I think that's what happens when mm. when your technical ability. But maybe that's also then a combination of having good management and well, it, it's again you bring back to the self awareness, right? Because I, and I get this argument all the time. I see it on social media yeah. all the time with, with because I teach communication skills. I, I I obviously have to speak about why it's so important. Yeah. And the people are like, oh yeah, tell that to <laughs> Elon Musk. He doesn't need communication skills. Yeah. I'm like, look, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> if you are Elon Musk and you are as brilliant as Elon Musk, Elon Musk, then don't worry about your communication <laughs> skills. Go all in. Take us to Mars, <laughs> yeah, buddy. Then, all good. But the thing is, most of us are not Elon Musk. <laughs> so we do need to work on our communication skills. Yeah. Same thing with technician. If you are a brilliant technician and you truly can get so good at that, people can't ignore you. Mm. Yeah, you don't need to be an entrepreneur. You don't need to be a manager. You alone being that will be will be so brilliant that one day a manager is going to come along and find you and help you anyway. That's think about the artist industry. That's what happens to the great musicians of our time. You know, like the Backstreet Boys and Britney <laughs> Spears. You know, the great musicians of our time. You know, you know the yeah, classics. Right. The yeah, classics, yeah. right? The worst thing is he's not joking. <laughs> <laughs> he's so they serious. Are my favorite. They are my favorite. What's wrong with that? No, Ninety-eight no, degrees. We're not here to judge. You know, boys to men. Yeah. You know. Hey, they have stood the test of time. They have stood the test of time. So. Well, but the thing is, generally you, you, in those stories, they're just technicians doing their thing. And then guess who comes along? A manager. A manager comes along and says, hey, you're brilliant. Boom. And then they become this incredible thing, right? Yeah. So it's, it is true you can focus on just that one thing, get so good at it and rely on it because I think people do come along, spot the talent, and then amplify elevate it. them, amplify it. Yeah, for sure. Very rarely though, do you see, well, it's different because in the world we live in now, there are examples of Post Malone. Mm. You were talking about him the other day. Yep. He, he put out a, a track you said on SoundCloud. Yeah. Just, he's the technician, he's creating music. And because of the internet, the internet now also acts as the manager. Mm -hmm. And it just immediately just blows you out of, blows you up yep. out of control. Yep. And he, had, he just had a couple of people share it for him too. And it, yeah, I think that's the other part. Is that the internet now has changed the game? Technology and tools mm. definitely help amplify it. Yeah. yeah, because I've I've also seen this happen to YouTubers where they're just technicians in a sense. They not, they're not flashy with their marketing mm. or anything, but in the end, they become this incredible online sensation because yeah. because of the platform. Yeah, for sure. That's really interesting. Mm. I like it. Yeah. What were we talking about? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. What book it, was, we well, it, was, it was working, it was working uh, in the business versus on the business. <laughs> you lost me at Backstreet Boys. Yeah, yeah. Britney Spears. Right, why are you joking? No, no, you, I don't. You don't, I, don't, like, you don't I, like, I like it. No. Yeah, okay. Hey, I actually love the you Backstreet Boys. I remember. Backstreet Boys are classic, man. As long as you love me, Me and one of my best mates, me? we used to play like GoldenEye on what yeah. was it, 64 or Super Nintendo. And what song would you jam to? Just the whole Backstreet Boys album, whatever Tell me a song. You sound like you're not a real fan. As long as you love me. I just said that one, so you can't say the one. Name another track. Um... Like all I have to give is something like <laughs> okay, that. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. There's a couple there. Oh, that's a common one. Name yeah. one that people, most people don't know. Oh, I can't. Yeah, I'm so you're not a real fan. I'm not, not a play. Fan. I don't want to be like. Yeah. Show me the meaning of being lonely. Classic. Yeah, yeah, another yeah. one. That's a very good one. I don't want to identify as a really <laughs> hardcore Backstreet Boys fan. That's not the objective of this it's, podcast. It's your loss. It's yeah. your loss. All right. Well, look. Mm. Jumping onto the next one. Mm. I let's move on. I want to talk about the 
the the third album the Backstreet Boys did. <laughs> this no, no, is no. changing. The business should serve the the business should serve you. Uh, you shouldn't just always serve your business. That one for me, I remember when I read it was a big paradigm shift for me because my parents, I watched my dad and his brothers. You know, my dad and his brother started one of South Australia's first Asian groceries, Dan Yin Fat, right? We started that, 17 June Street, Mansell Park, still there. Shout out to TVP. <laughs> still there, still there. And it was interesting because I watched my dad and his brothers, my aunties, uh, my mom there as well for a period of time. They served the business. It was very clear. The business was not serving our family. We were just slaves to the business. Yeah, I watched it ruin their health. I watched mm. it rob them of youth, uh, rob them of their physical well-being. My dad got chronic back pain. My uncle has chronic leg pain. And mm. I just watched that business destroy them. Uh, sure, we were able to buy cars and homes, but I just watched it destroy them. So to me, my default programming was, oh, so find yourself this overlord and then serve it right and then that's how i treated business so when i had a business i go okay well default how can i serve you and every day i'd lock in at 6 or 7 a.m because i was watching too much gary vaynerchuk at the time go work your face off so then i worked my face off from 7 a.m to 7 p.m and you know just yeah i served it so when i read this i almost felt i felt like are you do you know what a business is e-myth man Michael, do you know what it is? Yeah, I don't think you know what a business is, man. Yeah. So that one really rubbed me the wrong way when I first read it. Yeah, okay. Because I didn't believe it. Yeah. I just went, no, this is not true. I don't know what business you're talking about. Your story is a really hard one too because it actually worked and yeah. you became quite successful. <laughs> so I'm not really sure what the moral of the story is. No, 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 the moral of the story is. The moral like, of the story so is. Like, you were like kind of saying that you listened to too much Gary V sarcastically and then worked really hard, but then the end outcome wasn't <laughs> failure. It was actually success. So, uh, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, yeah, that's, um, so why was I mocking it? Because it worked. No, no, no. The reason, the reason why I'm, I'm bringing it up is because I think because my parents and my, my dad and his uncle, my, his uncles, his brothers, they didn't understand the power of systems and processes. That's what I was going to, right? Yeah. Is now, you know, when, when you turn your business into a McDonald's, you can take anybody in and they can run the business. My dad and his brothers didn't have to be the people in there every single day. Mm. They should have worked towards making themselves redundant. Whereas what they did, what they did was they, they took a massive loan, took massive risk to create themselves a job that robbed them of mm. health, time, all of it. My, my dad was barely there when I was young. Why? Because he created himself a job that he felt like he was the only one that could do it. But that's not true. What did my dad do? My dad was, he was back, uh, back of the shop being a butcher, filleting meat. Mm. And then after he does that, he would then go and spray the veggies, pluck the, you know, the, the, the bits of veggies that are rot off and then, then put stock on the noodle shelf. And... Mm. But he didn't need to do that. He could have hired for that so that he could have more time working on the business, yeah. right? But I didn't see those layers, bro. I didn't see mm -hmm. any of those layers. Mm -hmm. So then when I went into my business, same thing. My version of filleting the meat, stacking the noodles was, I did all the admin when I started. I did everything, bro. Yeah. So it was that, I couldn't undo that coding mm -hmm. until I met you. Until I met you, I kind of went, oh, wow. It's not about being strapped to the desk nine to five. That's not how you add the most value to your business. Mm. And I, 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 didn't, I didn't understand the, 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 the value of systems and processes. So I think let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and, and I think it goes really back to, and I'm guessing just sort of back in the day, you know, when your family started that business, the concepts of like business planning oh, dude, and having there strategies there was and all none. that probably didn't really exist. Nah, this right? was, they didn't even know English. It was, it was like survival based, a Absolutely. lot of it, right? Where it's like, yeah. we need to get, we've signed up for this thing. This is one method of doing it. Yeah. probably didn't really have the access to all the information and stuff that we have, right? Like you couldn't just go on Amazon back then and get three business books and then be no. like, oh yeah, there's this all just a really easy system that they we didn't even do. read. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, so I think it's different times and it's yeah. one of those things where, you know, just putting that into perspective. Yeah, as there's well, no blaming. Like, I'm like, not blaming. Yeah, like yeah. at that time, like that was yeah, the way yeah, that yeah. I'd say probably 99% of businesses were yeah. probably operated. Like if you think even about 
all these theories and stuff. Mm. Most of them around modern business management are what, 10, 15, 20 years old. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's true. In a sense. So mm. like even back then, right, you're coming off the end of the industrial age where it was just, we go work for someone. So the fact that you're starting out. So I think that's, that's one side of it. Mm. And the other is, I think it just really goes back to, yeah, there's, it's strategy, right? And it's planning. Mm. And I think the book really simply fleshes that out for people that are starting out where it nearly says it's like, all right, well, well, what's the, like you, you spoke about how, do, how does the business serve you, right? I reckon most people don't write a statement or a paragraph to themselves around when they go into business, what do I actually want out of this, mm. right? Very few even say what, they, what the business is going to achieve, right? Like in terms of a vision for the business or right. a mission for the business. But yeah. when you can combine those two, mm. and I think in the book, there's a line where it says that most like say founder driven businesses are generally a reflection of the person that starts it. Right. You know, like their values are embedded in there, how yeah. they operate is embedded in there. Yeah. So it's like, how do you then actually dig that out a little bit more mm -hmm. and turn it into the DNA? And then if you can find alignment, like I think that's what we're seeing a lot nowadays, but the holy grail, I think for people in work or in business or in life, whatever, it's like, how do you find maximum alignment, mm -hmm. right? So that your business is aligned with who you are, your work's aligned with who you are, your family's aligned, the people that you care about are aligned, mm -hmm. your hobbies are aligned, and then you're able to manage that and balance it all somehow. Mm. Like, I think that's what, when we speak to a lot of people, that's what they're striving for or along some spectrum of that line. So I think it's having clarity on what you want. And when you said that, I think I've seen you really build that out over the last four or five years Yeah. where I remember you used to always say, it's like, oh, I was, I was working and I was trying to build this ecosystem and this business, but I wasn't actually enjoying any of the fruits that were yeah. coming out of it. And I've seen you sort of shift that yeah. a little bit over the last few years. And I think it's just having that clarity. Like I look back at my notes even here and like my aim was just so simple back then where it was like have flexibility play golf and travel a little bit right and then spend time with That's loved so ones beautiful. right like it was those four things That's so beautiful like i even remember having it written down where i was wow. like get a free round of golf at this specific like golf club or whatever it was and it was like just simple goals wow. around that's as far as i could think in mm. terms of how it would actually serve me as in that's that that's the what you wanted that's from what the business. i wanted that's what i personally wanted from that business right and then and funnily enough what happened was so after <clears> i read this book, book and read lean startup in mm. the four hour work week mm. that actual that same week i started two businesses so i didn't mm. just start one i got that inspired after reading these books and i'm like oh it sounds so easy like based <laughs> oh, on just it. abc yeah well, it's, <laughs> so then i started a pub crawl company that same <laughs> oh, wow. week with a with a mate of mine and it was funny that both of the businesses both gen y golf and the pub crawl were really about meeting people and connection mm. too. So I was obviously at a stage in my life back then where I wanted to align some sort of passion that I had mm. and then build a community around it, work with people that I really cared about. So both of them had like my mates really heavily involved as well. So it was like, that was sort of like the things that were driving me probably on a deeper level. And mm. I think that's, that's really just amplified, right? Like in terms of, you know, we say what's our vision now and what really drives us. It's doing things that we love with people that we love and then everything sort of flows outside of that but having that clarity around what you actually want it in it even though eight years ago my clarity wasn't really that well defined oh, i think it was Look, looking I mean, back now i mean really like, yeah i feel yeah. like that's full-blown yeah. clarity okay, i mean yeah. it doesn't feel like it but yeah really it doesn't feel yeah, like yeah. it yeah like it was it was clear at that time but to me it feels like oh, i'm <clears> so like simple right in a sense but maybe simple is good so, well, I think simple is the key to yeah. life. But, but like, it, you know, like most businesses, if they were sitting there and the, you're pitching it, back yeah. then it would be like, oh, we need to create the biggest golf club right, in the right, world. Right, right, we right, need right. to have the world's largest. Like, even if you think about my goals there, yeah. it was like get to the first 200 people. Yeah. You know, go play a free round of golf at this club. So it was mm. really simple, like in that lens. But I think, yeah, if you look at it, at the like it was really well aligned with my values. Though. Yeah. So that's where it probably was quite strong and it allowed me to go down that journey. Whereas funnily enough, the pub crawl, it just probably wasn't that aligned with my values, mm. you know, I had a one year old at the time. It's like, <laughs> is, is going out on Saturday night, you know, and being out till 4am really the right <laughs> move. <laughs> like I remember me and Jesse who we were doing it with, I'm like, I think we're maybe just a few years too old yeah, for this yeah, idea. Yeah. Like, this would have been really good when we were 21 or 22. Yeah. Um, but I think the foundations are still there. It was around creating value through partnerships, yeah. creating a cool experience for people. Um, connecting with people. I don't think that people think about when they're starting a business. I don't think we think about, oh, what, what, what's this business going to do for my life? Mm. We tend to think we start a business because we want to make money. 
I was definitely a victim of that. I mean, I barely thought about anything else besides because at the time we, we, we were so we were so poor. I just thought, yeah, yeah, of course you start a business because you need to make money. You know, the whole idea of aligning business with your values. Gosh, I think that that is something we're we're only able to do in our generation now. I think to my dad, my my mom and dad didn't really think about, oh, we're going to start a business because it's going to give us this lifestyle. No, No, to them, we're starting a business because this overlord is going to control us. It's going to spit us out a little bit of money. And then that little money goes to our kids to go to school. Well, they had values, right? Their values were around security. Yeah. And like the future of- but it's funny, you say security, family. but starting a business with no knowledge on how to start a business <laughs> and don't even know what a business is, yeah, that ain't security, man. <laughs> that ain't security. So I think yeah. the security comes from them just knowing that I could trade 16 hours of backbreaking work for 100 bucks or maybe even 50. So to them, that was security. Yeah. Then that's how it started in terms of they worked yeah. for factories. Yeah. You know, they worked for different factories and stuff. And they could, they could just, I could just break my back for that. Do yeah. double shifts and I can make 50 bucks. Mm. That was security. And then they realized like, that, you know, they could get fired. So they thought, I'll just yeah. do that for myself. Yep. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting that you had that clarity when you started it. I did not think about what my business was going to do for me. I had more clarity on what I needed to do for the business yeah. for it to give me money. Yeah, the, I think there's two components there as well. It's finding a nice, healthy balance. Yeah. Because if you get too attached to what it's going to do for you, it also doesn't work. Like well, it's a very short-term well, approach, I think. Because then really what the next evolution is, like if I think about where we're at now, yeah. it's like, well, what does this business and what does this ecosystem do for everyone else? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Like yeah. it becomes at, at some point when you tick off a couple of those milestones right whether it's financial yeah or you know it's playing around a golf here or doing whatever it is mm-hmm. it's then around like if i now think about what the real big driver is it's purely about okay well how can this ecosystem yeah. help others thrive mm. create value change the industry mm. do all these other bits and pieces that aren't really self-focused because that's how you then i think maintain a healthy relationship with mm. it if it becomes too much about just you then I think it's really fraught with danger too, because well, then now you're attached to, if I lose this, yeah, yeah, what's yeah. it going to do to my identity? What's it going to do to my life and who I am as an individual and like all of that. And that, that was also a game that I never really wanted to play with the business. I always mm-hmm. wanted to maintain a pretty healthy relationship with it. Well, like you said, it's a healthy relationship so yeah. that if it's not about you at all, then you'll yeah. resent it no, anyway, no. right? Yeah, it's a, but I wonder what the... I wonder what the timing is, right? Because mm. I, I really think that if I made it about me since the beginning, and maybe I'm wrong, and I would love your yep. thoughts on this, but I really feel that if I started my business thinking about, oh, it's going to give me freedom, flexibility, and all of this stuff, it, I still think I would have got there, but it would have taken me longer. Yeah, would have taken me longer to get there. Whereas when I first viewed it as, okay, I, I am 100%, I will serve you in any way that you need, right? Whatever time of the day you, this business needs me, I'm there. I felt like that was critical because like a plane taking off, it requires the most energy right when it's taking off. Yeah. So you can't avoid that, but then don't stay in that mode because my parents stayed in that mode. Even when their grocery store was thriving, they opened a second one and they got a pharmacy and all these other things. They were still going at airplane taking off level of execution, <laughs> yeah. right? It's like that level because after a plane takes off, it just glides through the air, very yeah. minimal kind of requirement, yeah. right? They were, it, yeah. Take off all the way, man. So yeah. I think there's timing, right? For sure. Yeah. Well, the words that came to my mind then was alignment with who you are as an individual. Yeah. Like if I think about you just in general, yeah. you front end your effort really heavily. Yeah, like, like an so, airplane. So you go all I'll take in. off. That's your thing. Whereas yeah. I think me as an entrepreneur, like I'm, I'm probably a little bit more patient and I yeah. back end it. I like right. relatively low risk moves yeah, yeah. that have big upside. Uh, yeah. Sorry, you're like more so high risk moves that have a bigger upside, but okay. also <clears throat> can, you can win in multiple ways, right? And then I'll just sort of watch it play out a little bit more. Um, and that's probably just knowing again, it's self-awareness of knowing how you like to operate, right? Mm. Because if somebody had told me on day one, hey, we're going to give you all of this money and this capital, go deploy it, build this thing into this within 12 months and we're ready to party. That to me sounds horrible at that point in my journey. Cause I'm like, no, 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 I just want to read the books. I want to learn a little bit. I want to try a few things. I want to get the people around. I want to play around with this a little bit. I don't even know how it's going to really play out. You know, like I wanted that, that messiness and the flexibility to really find myself within it. Right. Whereas you, I think you just had a lot more clarity. You're like, all right, this is the game. I'm going to serve it. 
I'm going to execute it. Mm. If I execute it well, it's going to be amazing. And off we go, right? So I don't think that there's a right or wrong in this. Yeah, it, yeah. It's just more around what aligns with you. Because if you played it the other way, you've gotten so bored and been like, what are we even doing here? <laughs> like, I haven't even booked a gig yet. Like, <laughs> it's been four years now. And yeah. I think you've probably seen a lot of people in your world play that game like that. And it's not the right game for the world that you operate in. Like, you need to get work. You need to build your brand and speak at gigs and you need to go pretty hard. Like I don't, I really can't see how you can win your game. Like I think the way that you've executed your game in the thought leadership space, it's still the blueprint. Like if I ever spoke to someone and they're like, Hey, I want to become a thought leader. I'm like, yeah, you can do it. This is the most effective way that I think you can do it. And I'd recommend your version of that. Mm. Like I wouldn't recommend my version of trying to become a thought leader. My version of trying to become a thought leader is find somebody like you that's front end and all of that, <laughs> that effort and be like, Hey man, you want to hang out? Like that's, that's about as You want to do a podcast <laughs> together? That's right. I just, got to, I just got to wait. I just have to wait like eight years until you get to the point of success where it's like, yeah, oh. let's do a podcast with a little bit of spare time that I've got. I love it. Um, I love it. So I think it's knowing like, yeah, where you're at. Well, well you it's, it's realizing that at some point, well, I've seen, but I've seen you also go all in and go real intense. And, yeah. and like, you, you, you know, you, you always call me after those moments. You're like, oh man, I feel like I've been wired for the last few months. And it's because you've gone into deep execution mode, that, that lift off mode, right? I think the lesson that I'm taking away is don't stay there. Mm. You know, look, whether you're in a business that requires you to, to serve it 100% of the time or, or not, just know that if you are someone like me that grew up and watched your parents serve the overlord and yeah. just nonstop whenever it needs you, be there. Also know at some point, create some systems and back off a little. Mm. Yeah. And let the business serve you a little bit because I'm a victim of not, not enjoying the fruits at all. And just not even like at, at one point, I mean, I know we've spoken about it a few times, but at one point, not even having an identity outside of my work, you know, whereas now I, I feel a lot more proud of myself because I'm like, Oh, wow. When I have free time, like today, before our, before our podcast, I was like, Oh, wow. I've, I've got like 30, 40 minutes. <laughs> I'm just going to take my camera out of my bag and just go shoot some street photography. And I did that for 45 minutes with music and it felt great. Yeah. Vin from four years ago, no identity outside of work. I would have just sat outside of this room doing emails, <laughs> waiting for you. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, well, even if you think about it, like who we were four or five years ago, would we even be doing this? Podcast, no, right? no, because there'd we be other said, things that we would have prioritized. Exactly. We would have been like, oh, well, we've got the work or we've got this or yeah. like that. It's like, well, because yeah. the only thing we valued at the time was high ROI activities. Yeah. Whereas we didn't look at growth, uh, you know, personal growth, developing this friendship, growing this friendship, because I was thinking about it in the car too, Ali. I think one of the reasons why our friendship gets better and better is because of this podcast is because this is us actively growing our friendship. And this is you and me learning together. Mm. Yeah. So I think that's, that's one of the reasons why it's so special. Yeah, for sure. I mm. think it's, it's also just, yeah, like we're different and similar in so many ways, right? So we're able mm. to amplify the way that we learn together as well, which is really cool and special as well. We'll look at it from like, two point of views, yeah. points of view, right? The entrepreneur yeah. point of view and the technician point of view. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's, it's really cool. It's like, I love watching, like, you know, when we talk about this, mm. like funnily enough, the people that I love the most and that I admire the most, they're not entrepreneurs, right? Because I kind of have a relatively decent understanding of that. Like if we're in an event, I'm just speaking to the dreamers and all of that, it's not really all that interesting to me. I love the managers and the technicians, you know, like if I, I always say this, I'm like the people that I admire the most are people who are masters of their craft. And I think they're largely technicians that become artists, right? Like they're the people that I think are the most amazing humans in the world because they've gotten something so down pat and been able to commit to it because that's the opposite of like how I would operate. Like I could never see myself 14 hours, one skill set over a 20 year period. Like to me, just refining that. It's hard. Like I, I get mastery by accident over just a period of time, not with like deliberate practice or anything like that. So it's really cool when, you know, see people like yourself or like, you know, athletes, mm. um, artists that, that are able to just, yeah, be elite for a long period of time. I never thought of a technician who becomes really good to then evolving like a Pokemon yeah. to, and you know, like artist. it's like, yeah, yeah you're cool. a Charmander yeah, and then you yeah. evolve to freaking Charizard and that's artist. Right. I didn't think about I that. I just gave him a new chapter for this book. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Evolution, the yeah. evolution of a technician. Mm. Whereas, okay, is there an evolution to an entrepreneur? You become so good at becoming an entrepreneur, you evolve to what? 
probably like, I think the word that maybe gets thrown around is like a visionary, you know, like mm, I think okay. entrepreneurs, when they really execute at a high level, yeah. they change things pretty significantly. Like, yeah. like if you think back to a Steve Jobs, yeah, Oprah yeah. Winfrey, like, yeah. like these people, I think they just get so Next big level. with their vision that yeah. they change industries and the way that people live yeah. and the people that they operate. So, and it's probably the same, like. What about manager? What does a manager evolve to? CEO. <laughs> no, a CEO. No, CEO. A CEO. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. No, I think, um, well, the when, when I think of managers, I think about like maybe even conductors in an orchestra a little bit, mm. right? Like they're making sure that that music's played to the way that it needs to. Because really a manager, when they're really executing, the important role that they're playing is that whatever the promise that's been set yeah. by that vision is being executed yeah. and delivered consistently, right? And well, they, it, I think they're, they're, the, they're, they're the engine. Yeah. Right. They're the engine room. Like if good managers make sure that that car works and probably realistically going to be the most undercelebrated out of all of I those three so. roles. I was going to say that. Also arguably the most important. Yeah. Right. Well, it's the glue. It's the glue. They hold it all together. Yeah. It's the whole like, hmm. it's the ecosystem. Like I think they, they ensure that everything's nourished. Mm. Right. Like to me, like when I think of the manager, I think of like your mum, right? Like, <laughs> like mum's the thing that, holds everything together yeah, it's true. The family and life and does yeah. all the other bits and pieces very rare rarely celebrated to the levels that they should be yeah um or appreciated I, but the the key person behind the whole show i was just having this conversation with pay when just yesterday where it's funny because she she has this inner voice in her head where <clears throat> she'll sometimes say oh, i didn't i didn't do anything today yeah. i was like what <laughs> i saw you you know i saw you wake up get xander sorted for school looked after me in the morning, take him to school. Then you did like this epic errands run for all these things that we needed to do for, you know, we, we just got an apartment, all these different things. And then you went to pick up Xander, you prepared an incredible meal for the family. What the hell are you talking about? You did so much. Yeah. And, and you doing that enables me to do so much. Like, and I think it's funny because that manager role, I think sometimes they don't value themselves either. Mm. It's funny because they play such a critical role because things don't happen otherwise. And I think, and it's funny because I think it's probably it's probably important that the entrepreneur and the technicians acknowledge that role more often because if they feel valued, I can only imagine what would happen to the whole ecosystem. Sure. They would probably amplify the ecosystem even more if the other two roles, you know, understood their value a little yeah. more. Yeah. For me yeah. as well, you know, and I I just felt really sad that I didn't acknowledge that enough so that Heywin wouldn't have to feel like that. Yeah. You know, it, it kind of made me go, oh, wow, I could, could do a better job at kind of acknowledging that a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. And it just got me thinking about like, even when this book, it talks about the entrepreneur and the technician. Yeah. It nearly puts them both with a lens of like ego. Yeah. You know, like it's all about the entrepreneur having the big dream and yeah. the technician being the doing doer the work, and yeah. all that. Right. And I think that's the thing is when you look at mm. when these ecosystems really break down, it is when the, the manager is underappreciated yeah. or not acknowledged, right? Like they're not nourished enough. Yeah. And then you see the whole system slowly breaks down mm. because now the entrepreneurs just got like, you know, either too self-absorbed and not really linking down properly through the... This exists within a family dynamic. Probably exists everywhere, yeah. It exists everywhere. Like it's yeah. fractal, yeah. right? You think about it. I, I look at my family. In my family, I probably play the technician role and the entrepreneur role, mm -hmm. where I look at the, the future for this family. Where are we going? What's our dream? What do we want to do? What memorable moments do we want to create this year? And then I'm the technician because I'll, I'll go and work on that dream, try to make it happen. And then Paywen plays the manager. That's interesting. Mm. It exists within a family environment. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe maybe it just exists in all team environments. I think so. Any like kind if, of, yeah, any if, kind of if, team if environment. There's, there's a team or a collaboration. Mm. It's probably there. It's probably there in some yeah. way, shape, or form. Yeah. So it's cool because then you can use that framework in different areas of your life. Yeah. It's not purely just for your business, even at home. You know, and, and, I, and I think not only just to say it's important to appreciate the manager, I think it's important to appreciate all three roles. The person who actually does it, yeah. does the work, the person who actually manages it and makes sure it all happens, and the person who dreams it. There's so, such important roles. And I think when we get stuck in one role and wear one hat, we forget the benefits that the other roles bring. And if you can learn to remember that benefit, appreciate it, then mm. it just makes that ecosystem hum along in a more beautiful yeah. way. Well, you just got me thinking about like, it's like it nearly requires different strategies mm. to properly appreciate each of the three roles. 
Yeah. How because, so? because say, for example, if you think about most traditional businesses stuff, where the conflict exists is people like, oh, there's a go- there goes the entrepreneur again, right? Yeah, With yeah, the big yeah. idea, fluffing yeah. around, not actually doing anything. I love the way you're saying right? it too. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> like that real negative. Here we go yeah. again. It's like, yeah, there goes the manager again yeah. telling us what to do. Telling us yeah. off all the time, nagging us all the time. Here's another procedure and yeah, a process yeah, yeah. and now yeah. it's going to be, you know, we have to do this every day and we have yeah. to change our uniforms and yeah. do all this. And Here's then, a stupid technician yeah. telling us to cross our T's right. and dot yeah. our I's. Yeah, I'm too busy yeah. again. Yeah. Like, I can't do this idea. Too much on my plate. That's right. <laughs> so it's like- so hey, we, we're really good at like yeah, pretending yeah, to be all these roles. Yeah. And, and I think everyone defaults to the negative side yeah. of the person's like, yeah, inability to execute on what they have to. But it's very rare, I think, where you're in environments where people then actually celebrate each of those. It's like, oh, wow, thank you so much for building that feature. You know, that was amazing. And it's it's helped us in so many different ways. And thank you so much for putting in this new process so Ooh. that it saves everyone so much time. Thank you so much for, for taking that shot on that Hail Mary that has resulted in this new opportunity so we can bring more people. Like It's those things, right? Like, How do we reshape the thinking? And maybe that's what long lasting and better organizations or teams have, that it's nearly infused with core that love and appreciation of what everyone does. And I'll put my hand up, like, there's often times, especially when you're sitting in that entrepreneur role, yeah. that you just don't see all the things that are going on mm. and you're blind to it. And it's probably the same in the family realm as well, where mm. all these things are happening and you just don't acknowledge it and you don't see it. And then at some point, there's a bit of conflict that needs to get resolved or there's there's a bit of resentment that builds up. And I think mm. it's just probably based on that, is that people that's just a, want to be appreciated, that's respected. That's a big unlock. Yeah, it's pretty big. It's a pretty big one. Yeah. And you're just, you're so right. These 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 roles that they all play, they start to break down their efficiency and their effectiveness when they're not appreciated. Mm. Wow, that's really, yeah. that's so, you're so right. Because I, I mean, I hear my friends who are in, you know, in, you know, they're in organizational structures where they have a manager and that's the tone they use when they talk about their manager. Guess what, I have to do this Friday. Yeah. You, know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's always that. It's so, and then the managers will talk about the, the employees yeah. in the same way and just go, you know, guess who needs to go home early again? You know, it's like, it's just so interesting, isn't it? We look at the negative sides of it and we forget how critical these roles are and the benefits. Well, the default is we see it through our lens. That's right. right? Whatever our innate lens is, that's yeah. what we see it through. And when we're tired or stretched or whatever, it's, it's like, hey, who can we, who can we look at? Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's the importance of empathy, right? Being able to see things from other people's points of views. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That was a good one, man. I like that. that was nice. what, do you, what do you got on? Uh, what's the next thing we want to move through? So what are we going through? So we're talking about the technician. Mm. I mean, systemization, right? Yeah. I think we haven't talked in depth enough about that. I think you're very good at this. You (laughs) systemize everything. My team team would be, he's so bad at it, but I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and I think you even do it to the point where you systemize your life in a way that when you share it with me, I'm like, dude, that's freaky deaky. Yeah. Yeah. I go pretty hardcore on how I systemize my life. Yeah. Almost robot-like. Yeah. Yeah, because that's my one structure that I've got in place that isn't completely loose. Yeah. So I nearly have systems and processes for my life. Yeah. I so that I can mess around with all the all the different things that I want to do. Because otherwise what I realized a few years ago that it just wasn't sustainable. With mm-hmm. all the different things that I like doing and the variety and the lack of, I guess, perceived structure. Mm-hmm. The funny contradiction is I actually have to build in this structure to allow me to do that. So Right. Uh, so so structure allows flexibility pretty much yeah interesting huh? yeah it's like what, what's that book um discipline equals freedom mm. right it's probably a similar thing like that right where, yeah i think structure re- allows that flexibility talk us through how you've been able to use systems in yeah. your business and what, what what it's meant for you yeah well it's funny when when we when i was looking back at some of the notes yeah was there was like five six areas in the business that existed yeah right so just starting off it was just like looking at what were the tools that are available. So we, we found this tool called Sweet Process. Sweep Process. Sweet. Oh, Sweet. Sweet okay, Process. Okay. And then yep. you could sit there and pretty much with any task, you would put in a video and then it would have all the different tasks that were associated with that, that task. Oh, cool. Right? And then that's how we would do it. So even though we only had, you know, we were still pretty small, we started off pretty strongly around focusing on just documenting Mm. as many processes as we could because especially early on in your business journey you don't Mm. really you can't afford systems you can't build apps you can't build websites so like so much of the stuff's manual and it's usually 
a person having to follow a set of procedures or instructions. So it's just documenting those down, whether it's in a Google Drive, whether it's in, yeah, an a sort of app like that sweet process mm. where you can then share a link and be like, all right, this needs to be done. And to be honest, again, this probably isn't my strong suit, mm. but this book made me realize very early on how important that was. Yeah. And the reason why I valued it was it's like, okay, well, I might, I can create the process. I know I've done this a few times myself. If I then give it to somebody else, they can then look at it, then they can further optimize it. And if they then need to pass it down to somebody else, yeah. they can then further optimize it. Right. Right. And I think that's one of the things that I actually made a note about is that we probably haven't updated our operations manual or the documentation in a few years now yeah. because we've got so many systems and, you know, we've got team members that are just so good at understanding how the entire business works. Yeah, yeah. But there is a little bit of a risk there because a, vulnerability. a lot of it's in people's heads. Yeah. Right. So I think that's just the power of documentation. So when you talk about just processes, mm. anything that is something that you do recurring, right? So if you know that you're going to have to do it either every day, mm. every week, every month, every quarter, if you can figure out some easy process map, like manual or yeah. like a Google doc that just says, these are the six steps that you have to do. Mm-hmm. Screen recording is another good one. If it's yeah. on your computer now. I'm doing that now. You're doing it at the moment. Because I'm about to hire business. a team member. I'm doing a bunch of screen recording. And again, this was from your recommendation because you walked into my business and went, so you're doing what now? Yeah. Like I had all these manual processes that I was doing again, yeah. because I was still serving the overlord yeah. and because you've helped me. And I, again, I read this years ago, but I just didn't apply any of it. Yeah. Now I'm applying it and I'm telling you, I'm, I'm screen recording me every day now. And every time I screen record Ali, I get super happy because I'm like, I never have to do this again. That's right. I never have to do this again. Yeah. And with that time, with that five minutes that I have to do 50 times this week, I get to go spend hours with my son now. Yeah. And that's putting the entrepreneurial Dude, hat crazy. on right? or the manager's hat on because yeah. now you're like, and it's a mindset so shift good. because- what generally happens to us, to mm. most people, is like, hey, it's just easier if I do it. That's exactly right? what I say every time. I'm like, it's only going to take five minutes, I'll yeah. do it. But then I do it 50 times a well, week. Well, there's a, there's a friction with having to think of things deeper, of how they actually work, mm. and then documenting them down. And usually that's based on a realization. No, I'm really good at it. Of like, when I was making these videos, I was like, damn it, I'm really good at making these videos. <laughs> that's right. Because I'm, I'm a good communicator. That's right. Because <laughs> I'm, really really I'm really good at communicating. <laughs> right. And also, it's just, for me, it was this laziness of having to sit down for Everybody half an hour and an hour yeah. and then break down the task uh, and replay it. And I think that's what a lot of people fall in the trap of. It's like actually deconstructing what's involved with this is going to be harder than me just doing it for the rest of my life. <laughs> right? Like, so yeah. stupid. And, I'm so stupid. And it's true. And, and But then you find people, there's certain people that I've come across that are just programmed on how to break those down. And to me, it's like watching artists do their thing. Yeah, right? I, think, like, I think I'm one of them. Like, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> just just so saying. You're like, I've yeah, only done one, but I think it. I'm one of them. Yeah, you might be one of them, but <laughs> it, it's incredible, right? Like I've got a yeah. couple in my life, like I'd say, yeah, Jeremy, who works with me, Fugio, he's amazing at it. Like he'll yeah. look at a problem and then just deconstruct it so quickly to the point where it doesn't even need a process doc because it's just been systematized. Mm. Systematized, he nearly skips the second step, which is what most people do, is putting it in a process manual and yeah. will nearly just solve the entire problem. Well, it's a different, it's another skill set that like- I Well, here's the crazy thing, right? The manual. craziest thing I think is that some of the things that I'm, because you've helped me put this hat on, some of the things that I'm thinking about now, I go, wow, this doesn't actually even need a person. Yeah. There's technology now that does this, which is fr- even more freaky deaky. Yeah. Because I would spend easily an hour a week doing that. And that hour a week now has completely disappeared because I've plugged in some code. Yeah. That's messed up. And then because Pewen and I are just going through the process of we're buying an apartment and we have to do all this paperwork, we're working with one of the big banks, I won't say who, yeah. but far out, <laughs> everything is still being signed in person. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Yeah. And the number of times I had to write my name and my address and my date of birth and everything and the date, I just, I, I, it genuinely just blew my mind yeah. that we're still doing this and it's 2023. Yeah, banks are. But it just goes to show that it just, very archaic model. it just goes to show that if, if you're an entrepreneur right now and you're not taking advantage of all this technology or systematizing yeah. what you're doing, it's okay. Some of the biggest organizations in our country, in Australia right now, are still sure. not doing it. Yeah. This is crazy, bro. Like, it's just, I, I, I just remember sitting there going, I, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and it is, especially when you've been doing something the same way for a long period of time. 
to enact that change, right? So it's not only about just deconstructing Yeah, the this process, is deep DNA right? thing you're it's changing. It's a DNA here. thing. Yeah. Because then there's also the fear in the back of your mind. It's like, all right, now I've gone through all the effort of breaking down this process. Yeah. Now I'm going to have to hire someone. I'm going to have to give them the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And are they going to mess it up? And then will they leave because they don't like the process as much as I do? Yeah. And then, and I think that, that cycle is what stops people, especially yeah, yeah. when you think about the banks. They don't really have much competition yet. You know, mm. it's increasing. Yeah. So they're just like, well, Vin's still going to come in and sign the and form. He did. Right? And he did. Why are we gonna, he did come in. Why are we going to waste money? He came in twice. <laughs> That's right. Like, why are we going to waste time and money yeah. and training and rolling out it's this true. entire thing until the competitor comes along, right? Because then they'll get right. Ubered. And then they'll be like, oh my God, why didn't we think about just putting this into a computer program years ago? Now we've lost billions of dollars yeah. in our business. And I think that's what all's it's happened. It's coming. But looping back around to like mm. on the life side, how to do this. Mm. I think, and we've spoken about this in some of the other episodes as well. The way that I really go about it is I use a tool called Asana pretty religiously. Yeah. Um, and it's nearly got all of the different areas of my life sort of broken down. Um, and then it's got subtasks attached to each of those, yeah. right? So it gives me the ability to then update progress as I'm going through that. So say, for example, like even just things like our podcast, right? Mm. There's a podcast task. Mm. And it's like, all right, goal this year is to do 12 to 15 episodes. Then subtasks will be episode one, episode two, episode three. And then within that, it'll be like, all right, book flights in the studio, whatever it's going to be that then offshoots it. So then it all feeds into this system that is like my own sort of call it personal assistant management process, Yeah. right? Where not really much gets missed. Any ideas that come through, just put them into Asana. That's the manager. Log there, right? Asana is the manager. It's the manager, mm. right? And then it's always doing it. And then all I'm really doing is I'm every Sunday or whatever it is, I'm scheduling it in. Well, as, like, as, as you type it in, you're the entrepreneur because yeah, you're dreaming. That's right. The app is the manager. Yeah. And then when you're doing it, you're the technician. You're the technician. That's beautiful. Absolutely. That's beautiful. And that's when we do like our big yearly reviews, right? That's where you really get the entrepreneurial hat on, mm. where it's like, oh, well, what are my goals for all of these different areas of my life for the next 12 months? Yeah. Right. And then you really dream that out big and then you see where that's going to land. And then it's mm. like, okay. And then you get into manager mode. It's like, all right, well, to achieve that goal, yeah. what are the things that are going to happen or need to happen for that to take place? And you can do that with people, with relationships, with hobbies, with business, with whatever it is. And it's super simple, right? It's just that three-step process. It's like, what's the outcome that we want? Mm. Um, how can I measure progress? Mm. And then what are some of the actions that need to be taken for that to You know eventuate? what we need to do? We need to incorporate the E-Myth 3 type thinking yeah. into life design and recalibrate yeah. our process. Do you know why? Because I think a lot of the times the reason why I, I this is an assumption I'm making, but I feel that you know now, now when I look at my, my direct messages on Instagram, so many of the, the messages are about people who have lost their way in life, feeling unfulfilled, feeling unhappy. And I, I have this inkling that the reason that happens is because they are only a technician and they're keeping their technician hat on in life, trying to solve their life problems. But to be able to solve life problems, you need all three hats. You need the entrepreneur to think of the way out. You need the manager to create the path and show you the way out and actually schedule it in and then you need to be the technician to get out, Yeah, right? And I just feel that this is also a framework on how to think about life and navigating life. It's not just about business here because you're using the very same principles that have allowed you to become successful as an entrepreneur to now also guide you in life, yeah. you know? And, and I think you are one of the, you are one of easily the happiest people I know. Not to say that you, you don't get sad yeah. and, and, and stuff, but you, you live well. And I think you live well because of the system that you've created. No. Yeah, I think for sure. And, mm. and I think back to the necessity of why I built this system out. Mm. It was that because mm. years ago, I wasn't living like that. Yeah, I yeah. had so much messiness in there, you know, like you know, anxiety and like clarity was something I really struggled with. Like, because I always felt like I really, I truly didn't know myself. You know, some people are like, oh, I've always known who I was since yeah, I was a yeah. little kid <clears throat> and all that. I feel like I've just been reprogramming this guy for the last, like, <laughs> it's just like a broken down car that just keeps getting optimized. It's got like different colored panels everywhere <laughs> and <laughs> an engine that's making a weird noise. And I'm like, slowly over time, we'll turn this into an operating vehicle, you know? And yeah. that was always my goal from eight, nine years ago. It's like, it's been, how do you keep redesigning yourself and upgrade, upgrading the programming? really find out 
you know, the core of who I am and how I can then execute that to the best of my ability. And that system has definitely been one of the biggest things. Like now yeah. it's become such second nature that I don't even think about it. But even most of it, like decisions are so simple for me to make. Like even recently I was exploring a project, right? And within four days, I had such a good reflection of, okay, how well does this actually align? And mm. whether the timing's right, whether it's a move that I should pursue harder, whether we should take, you know, review and just stop for a bit and then change strategy. It's like this system is the thing that allows me to do that because those checkpoints are already there. You know what the metaphor is? Is that with the system you've created with your car, mm. you've now got a really clear dashboard. Right. You've got a really clear dashboard. You know exactly how fast you're going, how many miles you've traveled. You've even got a compass in this car. You know exactly where you currently are geographically. So when opportunities come along, you can look at where your current destination is and you go, that's way off, that's way off destination. If I want to go to this, this I'm going to have to do a U-turn. I ain't doing a U-turn. Yeah. Because I, I think a lot of the times when we don't have that compass or GPS system, then when opportunities come along, we don't realize that this opportunity that's just come along, it's actually in South Africa. You're in Adelaide. Yeah, it's a little bit out of your way, you know, whereas I think what you've been able to do is, and I remember this decision that, that you made, I was, I was shocked at how you were able to make that decision, right? You know, I won't share what it is, but I was just kind of like, whoa, how did you make that massive decision within four days? Yeah, That's kind of crazy, right? Yeah. And, and I think sometimes when we don't know where we are and yeah. then opportunities come along, all of a sudden now, you're in Adelaide, but you've just set a yeah. new destination to go South Africa. I love the GPS analogy too. Yeah. Because I think when you were talking about the technicians that are messaging you on the DMs, yeah. they're just driving around. Yeah. I don't know where I'm going. Yeah. And the, but that's because they, don't, they, yeah. they haven't put that entrepreneur hat on. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Or the manager. Yeah. Yeah. Or the manager. Yeah. The manager's probably like the navigator, right? Yeah. yeah. Tell, telling you which turns to take. Yeah. Red turn. We need you've petrol. lost your way. It's like the tire's flat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You drive, you've yeah. been driving on a flat tire and you've been trying to drive fast on a flat tire <laughs> and you've crashed the damn car. Yeah. Far yeah. out. Such a good life analogy. Yeah. I think we really should take that and work it into, mm -hmm. into our program. Yeah. yeah People brilliant. are just watching us on, yeah. live on podcast. Uh, no massage idea what we're talking about. What we're doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> it's cool. You're watching us learn. Yeah. And that's the thing. We iterate we... things that we're wanting to share with other people as well. But I think that's what, I love most about doing this is we're learning in the moment too. We're, yep. we're, we're, we're not saying that we know nah. everything far <laughs> out with the reason we're doing this podcast is because we want to commit to learning. Yeah. And this is the only way I can commit to learning is knowing that we're going to have to talk about that's this. True. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. So that's interesting. Thank you. I mean, I think that's a really good insight into how systems can help you in your business yeah. and how, if you're doing something repetitively, yeah. it's redundant, yeah. systematize it, get it out either to somebody else or there's online software and platforms now. But also use this intellect for your life. For sure. Because far out, you know, just as we discovered here, even within our own personal lives, there's a technician role, manager role, and entrepreneurial role that we have to play ourselves. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's really, well, just one thing in wrapping this up, mm. if people want to apply it a little bit more, yeah. is when you're actually thinking about taking action, break it down in terms of like projects, yeah. one-off actions, and then call it habits or mm. recurring actions, mm. right? Because it's the habits and the recurring actions that you can probably process a little bit more. Yeah. Right. And then realistically, if you're thinking about process manuals and you really want to document stuff that you don't like doing, yeah. the fourth one is around delegation, mm. right? So how do you actually put things into a document that instead of you allocating time and energy to it, yeah. you can use money or some other reward mechanism to get somebody else to help you with that task? Right, because that can also then amplify your impact mm. so that you can then focus more of your time and money or energy mm. on the projects that you actually really align with oh, where you really can good. generate the most value. Right. Mm. So that sort of provides a four step structure around um, oh, wow, that's brilliant. how to execute it a little bit more. I'm going to throw one in there too. This is kind of a psychological one. Mm. I find that sometimes when I'm an entrepreneur mm. and I'm trying to play entrepreneur at the same time as I'm trying to play technician, I don't do anything. Yeah, I feel like analysis paralysis happens <laughs> yeah. when you're like, I'm going to become an international keynote speaker. And then the technician version of Ben's like, your mom doesn't even love you. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like, why would you say that? Why, do you, why, does, why does my mom suddenly make every single podcast episode and I'm just having therapy sessions with you and you don't get any, give me any confirmation that my mom does love me? Oh, you know, like it's, 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 weird how, yeah. it's weird how that the happens. The dreamer right? just yeah, gets yeah, like, yeah. just legs chopped out chopped by the technician out. Yeah, before so, he even starts. So the reason yeah. I bring this up is 
Give yourself time slots to dream. Yeah. If it's Monday, 9 to 12, shut the technician up. You're not allowed to enter the room when I walk into this room. When I'm journaling for the next couple of hours, I'm allowed to dream whatever oh, hell life I want, right? Yep. So one thing that I've been able to do that I find really helpful is I, I'm trying to learn how to be that entrepreneur better, right? So I've been dreaming about this incredible you know, life that I'm going to be living in five years with, with me and, and around the world. And I can have a virtual studio in Malaysia and I can have a virtual studio somewhere in the US, et cetera. And I can be anywhere, anytime, right? And I give myself that permission. And then when I'm in technician mode, then be fully in technician mode, believing it's possible. Do you know what I mean? Like instead of just fighting against yourself all the time because you're trying to wear two hats at once. And I think that was one of the, I experienced the most inertia when I'm trying to be everything all at once. So now I just, I separate it completely. I really like that. Don't have them, don't have them in the same room. No, they're not. Maybe the, the manager room. can sit in when yeah. the, when the entrepreneurs. Uh, not even, out. not even then. Yeah. I, I would you keep the manager out. Right? I'd yeah. fully keep them out. Yeah. yeah. I'll just keep them out and then just kind of do yeah. it separately. I like and then that. sure, if you're a technician, you want to criticize some of that, then create time to criticize it, but not while you're dreaming. Not That's while you're dreaming. That's such a cool unlock. Yeah. I really like that because it's so true. Like sometimes you'll sit there and if you're just in a, like I'd, I'd nearly call it like a low energy state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. like, oh, I've got this, like A, first of all, the ideas, you just don't have the courage nearly to dream big enough mm. when you're in that. Because I think that's the other part is like when you're really wearing that entrepreneurial hat and yeah. you're thinking about, you know, imagining a bigger future and all that, mm. you also have to be in the right <laughs> state of mind and energy for that too. That's right. Right? Like could be around the right people at times too. And we've spoken about that. Like my way that I used to do that, even when I was really busy and I had limited sort of call it time and energy at times, it would be travel. Mm. It was finding out blocks of time where I could just be by myself. Yeah. And that's really what I was doing. I was letting that entrepreneurial side flourish oh, because in the daily I grind, that. I, that's I think why now, you love travel so I think much. now on reflection, it's probably the reason why, because that's where that person gets to flourish, right? It's in your environments. It's inspiring. Hmm. The daily grind isn't, as reactive. Well, you, right. you're not even in the environment of a yeah. technician at that point. You're yeah. literally in the sky. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You're in the sky, right? Like, and I think it's the same thing as like, Ooh. whether it's retreats, whether it's going for a walk, whatever your version is of that, mm. that puts you in that space where you can just quiet the mind and sort of dream a little and- Yeah. You know what mine is? Bigger. You just yeah. mornings yeah. with a nice cup Perfect. of coffee and then just playing See, really beautiful. inspirational music. I wish mine was that simple too. Yeah, like, you got to get on a yeah, plane, on a plane and plane, freaking like, fly the half yeah, across the it's world. The it's so taxing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I do it really cheap. Yeah, yeah you do no, it it's really amazing. <laughs> I love your version. But yeah, even mine used to be like back then, if I think back to it, there was yeah. the Sundays at the cafe. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Like going for a 30 minute walk, yeah, being in the cafe. Bowl. Yeah, you sit there and have a coffee and. Yeah, That's a good point, though. I think I, think, I really love what you I said. I think, though. yeah, to the Separate listeners, them. to our listeners out there, just just give yourself time to be a dreamer. Yeah. Know that you're going to give the yeah. technician stage time to be able yeah. to voice their concerns yeah. and, and how yeah. it's maybe not possible. Yeah. It's all right, but just give it the full time, you know, to 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 let those ideas actually flourish. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But I think that's very hard. Yeah. That's very hard. That's borderline split person, uh, split personality, right? Uh, but I think we, we're all kind of like that. I think so. We all have it. Well, it's happening anyway, right? Yeah, you said it, it is, before. It is. The but only it happens difference in the moment. was you, you had everyone yeah. in the same room. Yeah, no, no. And no, that sometimes that technician's voice can get so loud. Yeah. Where like, yeah, the technician needs to ground some of it in reality. But yeah. I think the best way to nearly handle the technician mm -hmm. when you've got that hat on and it's just you playing out these roles. Yeah. Is it's like, hey, technician, like this is nearly decided. Yeah. Right. Like we're going to go we're, for this. We're doing it. We're doing this. Yeah. It's like, can you help me figure it out, please? Yeah. yeah because yeah. I just really want to turn it into a reality. Yeah. So like, even though you might not like it, yeah. and you think it's going to like be really hard for us to execute. Just give me like your five best ideas of how you think it might be possible. Yeah. Right. And then it's like, it's still like having these, like, I think it's a, a lot of this is around reframing mm. the conversation mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm. And it's dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> and it's dangerous because, and let's acknowledge it, right? Because I've seen many entrepreneurs around me who have not succeeded, yeah. who have, you know, big sky high dreams and the technician went along with it. And the technician is now in their life going, yeah, I told you. I told you, I told you right from the start, mate, that was a terrible idea. You went ahead and didn't. And look at where we are now. Yeah. Bankrupt, right? And it's, it, it goes back to the entrepreneur's creed. Do, do you know the entrepreneur's creed? You don't? Go for it. Well, I, I, don't, I think I've read it on the podcast before, haven't I? I think so. Yeah, I think I have. I won't do it again. But it's just such a good, good creed because it just talks about the importance of taking a shot. Yeah. I mean, uh, look, I, I don't know what the meaning of life is, but I know that 
we are here for a limited amount of time, take a shot. Mm. Take a couple of shots if you can. Mm. Don't take shots that are the be all and end all. Don't take, you know, like we learned yeah. from the psychology of money book, don't take shots that if you take it and you miss, you're dead. Yeah. yeah don't take those kind of shots. Mm. But take shots where, you know, if you don't miss, it hurts. It's all right. Pain's a part of life. You know, no pain, no gain. Yeah. Right? Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Did he say that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think yeah. so. Okay, yeah, probably not. It's, yeah. It's getting late into the episode. Yeah, it is getting late into the episode. <laughs> but look, I I I I love this this yeah. book. I think it's helped me in in more ways than one. Um any kind of, you know, if we had five minutes each to kind of close things out, do you have any other thoughts in the book that that we didn't get to that you really want to be able to get to? I really like this. So it talks about six rules to win. And oh, I just sort of summarize yeah, this yeah, a little bit. That. So the yeah, six rules it. were create value for all, operate whatever it is with the lowest amount of skill. So most people are like, oh, we've got to get the most skillful people that's at the me. technical level. Whereas it's like really good processes and systems actually allow you, like that's the McDonald's version, mm. right? Where you can anyone, operate a 15 year old can come in. That's right. It's so simplified and clear that anyone can do it. Um, stand out as a place of order. I think that really speaks to the manager where it's like, Hey, this is, this is the way we go about it. This is how we treat our customers. This mm. is the uniform that we're all wearing. Um, have all work in the ops manual, provide a predictable service and then have a consistent like brand. So I've sort of changed these a little bit and just summarize them in my own way. Mm -hmm. But I think that is really cool. Like for anyone that is starting out as a venture or uh, yeah, starting a venture or looking at optimizing their team or whatever it is, there's six rules where if you applied four of them, you can have something pretty solid. Mm. I think just from a operating perspective. Oh, I love uh, that. There was just one that I had written down there. And then I think just my, the overarching thing, just when I look back on this book yeah. is it just, really clarified the importance of strategy and having a plan and having processes. And if you execute those over a consistent period of time, mm. I think it just increases your chances of winning in this game. In a game that is pretty hard, it's yeah. pretty competitive and no outcome's really guaranteed. That combination there gives you a pretty solid chance. And then I just love what we've spoken about a lot here is just have awareness on who you are within those roles and align with that the best you can. Like, it's one of the big things I've been thinking about a lot lately when I've been having discussions. It's like, well, what's your superpower? Like whether you're a technician, a manager, an entrepreneur, whatever it is in whatever life, you know, in a family, in a relationship. So like people that have clarity on where they bring value to others, I think that's also a pretty big indicator of how you can be happy too. You know, and it can be done on such simple levels. Mm. Like it's like, I'm just that person that's always reliable. I'm just that person that if you call up, I'm going to answer the phone. As a manager. Right? I'm just that person where, you know, I'm going to make sure that everything operates. I'm that person that's always dreaming big. I'm that person that, you know, is never really there. But when that person really needs me on that one big occasion, they always turn up with some something massive. It's like find out what it is, you know, what's your value and how do you execute that? And I think people that have clarity on their value and how they're able to execute it, and then they align their life with that. Mm. Pretty cool stuff happens. When I kind of think about my closing thoughts for this one, I just think always remember that it's the combination of three that creates successful lives, successful businesses. And whether you're a solo entrepreneur or you're running an organization, I think just keeping that balance in mind when it's out of balance, that's when we run into issues. And when I reflect upon my journey from all the way when I was super young, selling MP3 plays, the magic to building online businesses, et cetera, I've just learned that every time I had a shot at playing this game, I changed the percentage of entrepreneur versus technician versus manager that I played. And every game that you play will have a different percentage that is required. If you're a solo entrepreneur, I'm speaking to that one specifically. And finding out that balance is super important because you play too much in the technician bucket and you're not playing enough in the entrepreneur bucket for your specific game, you'll lose the game. You, do, you, you play too much manager and not enough technician and too little entrepreneur, you'll lose the game. Every game has a specific percentage structure. And the sooner you can identify that through 
being more self-aware and, and asking for help, et cetera, the sooner you'll win that game. Love it. So find that, find that split and uh, continue to play. And even if, even if you've played a few and, and you've been burnt a couple of times, just, just know that play again. You know, add some extra coins in. Go again. Don't, don't stop because I find that the consistency, I find that anything I achieve success in my life, it's the places where I've been the most consistent and where I've played at the most times. So don't be discouraged. If you've uh, lost a couple of games and, uh, you know, For sure. work, find some extra credits, the arcade is still open. For sure. And just my sort of last one on this is that this applies like not just to founders and people that are starting a business or own a business. Like you can use these principles, whether you're an employee, yeah, like definitely. even if you're not working, you're a student, like just, it's, a, I think it's a type of thinking mm. that can be applied in a multiple, yeah, in so many different ways. Well, within a team, if you're working for someone, yeah. you, you acknowledge that, wow, even if you made that mindset shift and you yeah. look at your manager in a different way, yeah. you appreciate your CEO in a different way. Yeah you now become a better and more well-oiled machine. That's right. If you're a technician, how can mm, I become the best technician? That's right. How do I play my role within the team? And there, I'm a manager. You know, even yeah. in you reading it, you realize your own value. You have more self-confidence, more self-worth. See, all of that is important from, from all angles. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Vinan Ali Show. If you enjoyed it, please go grab the book. It's an incredible book, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Mm -hmm. And we look forward to having you join us for the next episode. Awesome.